But welcome into the Backroads Bill podcast. I'm Ben, and this past weekend was the North Bay Home and Garden Expo down at Memorial Gardens, and the whole Echo team was down there. And on Friday night, we actually shot an episode of this podcast. So what you are going to hear uh, for the next, I think it's 35 odd minutes or so, is all of this was shot on location at Memorial Gardens, our first ever on-site podcast. Now, if you've listened to uh, to North Bay with Love, you know that myself and Lisa go on location quite a bit, but this is the first time uh, me and Bill have been able to go down. Because of that, I had to run cameras and audio and everything like that. You will not hear my voice uh, in this podcast in, outside of the, the introduction and the outro. But Bill did get a chance to sit down with someone we've been trying to get on the show for quite a while, Dr. Jonathan Pitt, who is a professor over at Nipissing University, where he teaches Indigenous Studies and Indigenous Education. And it was a, a great conversation. They talked about spirituality, pictographs, which we have uh, we have an episode on that actually uh, that's out that you can check out if you want to know a little bit more by, behind the history of, of pictographs and the tricksters and little people. And that's something that uh, Bill has mentioned in the past on this on this show as well. Uh, they talk a little bit about that and and how it fits within certain indigenous cultures which it, again it was it was so incredible to hear uh, these two gentlemen speak about about these topics so without further ado let's hand things over to bill and jonathan in in my lifetime i've had a number of of mentors and Gord Restool from Dokey's First Nation was my first mentor, and I learned so much from him and, and about weather prognostication, which I continue to do, all about natural signs. And then when George Cucci was at the Canadian Ecology Centre with the Ontario Provincial Police, and the program then was called Native Awareness, and then Jonathan, for I, I can't remember actually how how we met, probably through, through the university or somehow through education, because we're both educators, and I consider him... Uh, a mentor of mine and uh, Jonathan it's a real pleasure to, to have you here and talk about the things we're going to talk about and uh, I, I must say this to the to the viewers and the listeners that uh, you, you have such a, a, a great history as being a knowledge keeper and, and maybe just give us a little bit about your background and, and just bring us fast forward today before we get into what we're going to talk about. Miigwech. Uh, bonjour, uh, Kinawea. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, well, my, my journey is, is not unlike uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of Indigenous people. We've, we have a lot of similar uh, experiences, a lot of things that kind of interweave and, and, and connect us. Um, but when I, when I speak, I just want to kind of preface anything I say. I don't, I don't speak for all uh, Indigenous people. I can only speak for myself and, and my own experiences and and the knowledge that, that I carry, um, because you know, remember, Indigenous people we're not a monolith, right? Like, um, you know, we're 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 not a homogenous group, right? There's there's a lot of uh, differences, and you know, even prior to uh, you know people coming, newcomers coming to Turtle Island, uh, you know, we always had that First Nation to First Nation relationship. So, um, you know, my my experience, I'm you know, I'm part of the Anishinaabeg Nation, uh, I'm part of the Huron Nation as well. Um, my experience is in uh, Indigenous education, uh, primarily Indigenous uh, Indigenous studies, as well as uh, uh, planning in uh, Anishinaabemwin uh, or Anishinaabemwin if you're speaking uh, Nipissing First Nation dialect, um, uh, as well as uh, working in the mainstream education system. So, uh, you know, having having those uh, experiences are really kind of what um, brought me to this kind of time and time and place that we're at now. Yeah, and, and and for for the listeners too, uh, in the past we've done a number of stories, and and I want to I want to salute you because, uh, as a white person, I, I need to know, I need to learn, and and that's been my journey to learn, and so I, I hope all people can reach out to people like you and and get an understanding, so we can we can go forward and 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 in my in my case backroads bill it's all about sense of place so when we're out on the landscape and it could be uh, and we're on traditional lands that always kinds of comes into the, my story because I need to put that in there uh, in one shape form or another and again we've talked about so many things but I thought we'd start off with with pictographs and um, and maybe you can explain what pictographs are, so, and then I'll give you the, the, my version of them. Because when I come across them, it, it's for me, it's like, 
it's the stone canvases there. And for me, every time I see them, it's an opportunity in my whole lifetime, uh, a, a chance to learn something. I may not know the answer, but it's a chance to learn that people were there and doing something that we need to understand. Right. Well, in, in all things with Indigenous culture, all things are interconnected, right? So all, all of the... Um all of the things within um, our worldview are, are, are deeply connected not only to both the, the physical realm, um, but also the spiritual realm. And, you know, f- uh, for us, uh, our connection with the land is deeply rooted in our well-being, our wellness, um, our identity. Uh, so, you know, when we think about things in a, a cultural context, uh, pictographs are, are something that um, is interconnected with a, with a number of different uh, areas within our culture. It can be interconnected with um, things like uh, vision questing. Um, can be interconnected, you know, with uh, with ceremony, uh, ritual, fasting. Uh, can also be um, uh, interconnected with uh, with teaching, and it can also be interconnected with uh, location. Um, it can also be uh, deeply uh, deeply rooted in. Um, you know, understanding of those rites of passage, right? So, you know, there's many, many ways the pictographs connect us. Yeah. And, and you know, I, um, I was I was at City Hall today uh, for a, a, for a meeting, and of course, as soon as I walk in, and I and I don't know the complete story how when the when the what was then called the flash cube of City Hall, but in the main foyer, there's the Kennedy Island pictographs, and there's there's a short uh, interpretive piece beside it but i also think back that what a what a wonderful it was a, it was forward thinking to put that on Th- that's the welcoming symbol that's the first thing you you walk in there that's the first thing you see before you get on the elevator or turn the other way and and, and so those kennedy island pictographs not the first ones i i saw but uh certainly the, the closest ones probably to where we're sitting uh, right now and the other thing for me uh, in my lifetime, I've been always tried to figure out uh, my spirituality, and whether it's pantheism or uh, you, you know what's druidry or something. Before the white people uh, arrived, uh, and you said the deep connection to the land. That's my that's my connection, and I've been trying to figure that out my whole lifetime because other things we're going to talk about. That's those are important elements to me. I feel my best outside. I feel myself outside. I feel spiritual outside. And it's not the cathedral of an organ. And we all grew up with organized religion, probably whether we liked it or not. But then for me, it's been outside. And I've been trying to define that. And I thought, I'm going to I'm gonna ask that question too. Not about your beliefs, but maybe you'll share some of them. Because for me, I'm still searching. And so if I was an Indigenous person, I would feel I would feel at home, so to speak, because that's the closest I can can get to. Well, I, I know from speaking to a lot of um, Indigenous people that have been displaced through uh, colonialism or residential schooling or 60s scoop and different different things that have happened throughout history. You know, they've they've always had that connection to to the land, and you know, the, you know, we think about uh, different philosophies or worldviews and. For us as Indigenous people, one of the things that we often uh, talk about is all our relations or all my relations, right? So when we're talking about, you know, uh, Indigenous philosophy like that, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, all my relations like in a nuclear family sense. (coughs) Excuse me. We're, you know, we're thinking about it from, you know, our relationship with um, the animals, right? Who are our first teachers, the plants who are our first teachers you know like when we saw an animal you know eating something we'd say you know why is that animal eating that there's a there's a reason for that right or you know when we'd see that that's that spider web that taught us how to make our nets you know so all of those things that concept of you know it's not just you know mother brother uh brother you know sister father this kind of stuff it's that connection with uh you know the rocks the trees the animals that sense of family uh, extends beyond what we commonly, you know, refer to in mainstream society as a notion of, or conception of family. So, you know, thinking about that connection um, to the land and that in that philosophical context with spirituality, I often think think about, you know, what did Turtle Island look like 
before the advent of newcomers and settlers and, and so on. And often we often have to envision it as a very rich spiritual landscape. And, you know, spirituality for us wasn't just limited to one day a week or one, you know, one time of the week. It was all the time, every day, right? And, you know, when we, we would get up, you know, we, uh, you know, offered uh, certain medicines depending on time of day or what we had available and, and so on. But all of those things were deeply part of our, our daily, our day to day. It wasn't, you know, spirituality wasn't just sort of a, in a box. It was, it was everything and, and, and everything, right? Yeah, and, and the closest I can get to that, uh, I've spent almost 40 years in Sammy D. Champlain Provincial Park, and during COVID, when no one's around, I thought I, I thought I knew nature, but then when no one was around and it was, the, nature came to me, the animals came closer, there were th that whole thing, and I thought to myself, and I started to write poems every day for 411 consecutive days. I think it was, that was, that for me, it was like my spirituality that I could make those connections with the land, with the animals, with the, with the wind, with the weather, and all those kinds of things. And, and so it's so, so important to me. And so again, when, when I do stories, I think about, I'm doing this story for a purpose because there is the link to the land. And in the past, we've talked about all kinds of things. And, and uh, you know, the pictographs, we could talk at what do they mean, but where, and then that's still open for discussion, for interpretation. But but I, I love looking at the the motifs and and especially the ones uh, I'll say that are easily interpreted. I know I've been to Moose Line Lake up by Ignis, and there's probably the most the, the most frequent collection of, of pictographs all over the lake, and and often the, well most often in every single one there was a moose. And sure enough, when you get to the most narrowest part of the lake, and to this day you see where the moose cross. Of course, the moose was on the because they were saying probably something about good hunting or moose is there, but but uh, you know again the, the talk about maybe uh, Mishipishu or those kinds of things that are more of of of, uh, of, of symbols that meant m meant much to the the spiritual side of worshiping the land, so to speak. Well, often you know certain pictographs depending upon location, and there was. You know, when we think about rocks, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, process and thought that goes into site selection. And, you know, often for uh, Indigenous people, uh, we often went through, and we, and we still do today, uh, but we participate in ceremony and you might have a, a fast or a vision quest. And then during that, that, uh, that process, sometimes, uh, you know, um, the, the artist of the pictograph would talk to their spiritual leader or guide um, and they would uh, help help them interpret their dream and then they would go and, and, and represent that in, in pictograph form. But uh, pictographs are, um, at least in, uh, in this area, very, um, you know, rare because ochre uh, was a widely uh, uh, traded commodity. There was only a couple of places where it could be found. One, one very close to here, one not so much further away. So, you know, there's that whole uh, component too that ochre was very, very valued. And uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, something that um, when someone participates in that, uh, in that process, we often think about art and the, uh, the art, the canvas, the face of the rock and so on. But art was uh, deeply rooted in, uh, in the Anishinaabeg Nation indigenous culture. And it wasn't something that was um, uh, just done once in a while, but it was in everything, right? You could you could see it in our moccasins. You could see it in all all different areas within our uh, within our culture that that um, that that came out. I think I think it was probably again uh, kind of like a a tribute to the the forces of nature, whatever they might be, or the the plants and the animals because they were so important. And again, uh, I know I, I I like to stop and think about that a lot when I'm on my journeys and 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 try to uh, you know be grateful and 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 salute that sort of thing. The the other thing, uh, another story we did was uh, high places and rocks and things. And I thought uh, this is a great opportunity for the listeners to talk about vistas and vision quest sites and and why those uh, heights of land were important. Well, you know, 
a lot of uh, important uh, spiritual sites. Um, a lot of them were uh, connected with family, right? So a, a family would have a have a site, and then it would be passed on uh, through the family. And some were also community based. But as uh, se- settlement spread, um, some of those sites have been given up. Some of them uh, have been abandoned. But the more remote sites tend to um, survive. They tend to uh, uh, still be used, and a lot of them are, are kept in secret for that reason. Um, you know, so that they're not uh, desecrated and and abused and uh, and so on. So, um, you know, often at those uh, places, whether it might be a place like um, Dreamers Rock, where White uh, Fish River uh, First Nation is, or for uh, Tomogamy First Nation with uh, Spirit Rock and so on, a lot of those places, uh, you know, where ceremonies conducted, you know, we had the the uh, understanding that. You know, just because you can't uh, see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Like, uh, if you went back, uh, you know, 50 years ago and said to somebody, hey, I got this uh, device in my pocket, and if I take this device out, I can uh, I can talk to somebody, you know, halfway around the world or around the world right here, right now, uh, and they'd say, no, no way, there's no way. There's, what's connecting that, right? Where's the, f- the physical land line? But... Um, you know, we always understood that at our spiritual sites, you could uh, communicate at those sites, uh, you know, up through the smoke and, and so on, through that other plane of existence. And uh, there's actually been documented cases where, uh, through ceremony, uh, people may have been able to call for help and, and, and so on. So there's lots of uh, understanding that those uh, s- spiritual sites are sacred, and they're sacred for a reason. Yeah, and again, I, uh, the Maple Mountain is the anglicized name, but when you look at that uh, at different vantage points on Lady Evelyn Lake and you see it, it's kind of, you think, oh, that's, that's important from your viewscape, but it was important to Indigenous people for a, a variety of reasons. And, and whether they went to the top or not, it, it didn't matter. It's, it was an important point on the landscape for them oh absolutely and a lot of there's a lot of uh interconnection like i said between some of those heights of uh heights of land uh, spiritual sites and so on and um you know those um those sites tend to be uh tend to survive because they are so remote right they are uh, you know harder to harder to get to off the grid so to speak so there's less chance of uh someone going in and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe doing graffiti or something. You know, not not uh, respecting that site for what it is. I know you know who Craig McDonald is, and James Raffin was on uh, the Backroads Bill podcast a week or two ago, and he's written a book on Craig McDonald. Is going to be another one uh, produced by the Timmy Ammunition of the Bear Island coming out this spring, and uh, I mean the the names. The, the traditional names are important because it usually described uh, an important aspect of the land. I don't know you can give a few examples right off the top of your head, but that, that was really, that's, I'm re- really looking forward to that. Well, and, and also, too, in some of the older maps, um, some of the older maps have a different dialect to them. They have that, uh, that uh, Proto-Algonquin language, the parent language to uh, Ojibwe and Cree and Oja Cree and Algonquin. So sometimes that language is used in, uh, in ceremony too, right? In uh, sweat and so on. So, you know, that's an older parent language and some of those maps have that, uh, that dialect in them. That are, and they're uh, much older than some of the more contemporary, contemporary maps. But uh, when we think about, you know, the land and, you know, what we often talk about uh, Ekonomage, we talk about uh, a key, the land, right? But we talk about Ekonomage or in dialect. Some people call it uh, Ekonomagis, right? And we say, you know, the land is teacher or uh, learning from the land. And, um, you know, that's a, a different way of knowing. It's an in indigenous, in an academic sense, you know, someone would say that's uh, indigenous epistemology, right? But uh, we say it's a way of knowing, right? Or it's... Uh, and we think about uh, you know how we how we make sense of make sense of things and you know sometimes the land teaches you but it 
it, it might not uh, teach you in a traditional uh, schooling sense. It'll, you know, maybe it teaches you something about yourself, like maybe patience, All right? So, um, you know, when we're out on the land, you know, there's lots of things, uh, you know, that we learn and sometimes uh, it's those most important lessons that we that we carry with us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and it's kind of not a segue, but the other thing before I lose track of the rocks is that another story, I remember I had, I asked you uh, about to explain you, you know, the tricksters and the little people, not always at pictograph sites because there's crevices and cracks, but that's, a, that's kind of, a, that's kind of the, the, another part of the, I think, I don't want to call it the fun part, but there's a, there's, tell us about the tricksters and the little people. And I know you have a story for us to illustrate that. So some, some people, um, some indigenous knowledge holders or carriers, you know, they'll, they've even uh, said that, uh, you know, the, uh, the little people, the wee folk, they, um, you know, they can be responsible for some of those pictographs, right? That they're, uh, that's, that some of those pictographs, they've done them, right? That that's a gift that they've, uh, that they've given. And, and uh, some uh, communities in the uh, northern part of the United States and some in, uh, indigenous communities, they actually had... Uh, honoring the little people as the theme of their gatherings and so on in recent memory. Um, but there's, uh, you know, they're referred to as different different words, right? People uh, use different words to uh, refer to them. Some some people call them uh, Mimigwesic. Uh, some people call them Piansuk, right? Depending depending upon location. and But there's different types of, uh, of little people. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, more like a, like a little... Uh, for, uh, for a human, hairy human, uh, some people will say, you know, it's it's bad luck to talk about uh, the little people. Other cultures uh, and different First Nations will say no. Uh, so it depends upon. We respect those differences from community to community, um, but uh, we also know that there's um, that there's different uh, different types. Some of them are more uh, elemental, right, uh, and can. Uh, shape shift that uh, you know maybe between the rocks and the and the creases and so on so there's that uh, understanding with it too and you know um, there a lot of people when you would when you talk to them about these things you know they'll say uh, you know that uh, you know that's just myth or that's just uh, you know stories or telling tales and and so on but uh, you know there was a there was a group from uh, Griffith University in Australia uh, a number of years ago, who uh, did an archaeological excavation in Indonesia, and uh, they uh, uh, don't know whether it was Griffiths themselves or it was another group, but they actually found uh, the remains of uh, hobbit-like humanoids and the skeletal remains. Um, so that's uh, when the Western science, right? We talk about different philosophies, indigenous worldview philosophy versus Western. Uh, Western leaning or uh, that sort of uh, Western science leaning philosophy. That's an example, and sometimes it takes that a little bit to catch up to uh, indigenous knowing, indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, for example, when we smudge, you know, the the sage, um, we always knew it was to cleanse, right? It would cleanse us and, and so on. But uh, you know, when they actually did uh, scientific study on it, they realized, yeah, the sage actually kills bacteria, right? So there was that. Uh, that understanding that comes with it, but to come back to the to the rocks, um, in our in our worldview in our philosophy, we talk about grandfather rocks, right? And rocks is having having memory, right? And uh, we say, you know, those rocks have been around for a long time, um, longer than our physical bodies, you know, can endure. And uh, you know, that's why even within our sacred fires, we try to use rocks that haven't been exposed to the to the elements of the earth and and, and so on. And uh, you know, with that with that sacred fire, we often remind ourselves that we come from the from the star people, from the star realm, right? But uh, those rocks we always knew had that memory that uh, is longer than anything that we could endure, and they hold that memory. And uh, you know, that Western science always said, you know, like what are you, you know, what are you talking about? Rocks have memory. Well, recently on uh, quartzite discs, uh, they've been using that to store uh, loads of data, way more than you get on a, 
on a jump drive or uh, you know people used to store data on I'm dating myself here but store data <laughs> on uh, on CDs and yeah, yeah. people used to burn CDs and things like that but the, they can store so much data on those rocks on that quartzite disc and that's just a you know, a way we're, we've been saying this for years, right? But now science is kind of catching them and saying, hey, look what we found. And we're, yeah, we've been telling you that for a long time, right? <laughs> now, can you tell us a story about the little people? Maybe that one you told me once about the fish being stolen. Um, well, I, I know, uh, you know, we, we often don't talk, like in the, in the winter time, like we are now, we usually share some of our stories for us, you know, as indigenous folks, that was the time when we, we would share these stories in the winter and so on um you know there's been uh, uh a few people that have said you know when they've been out uh <laughs> they've been out fishing and so on they've uh they've caught some fish and then they turn around and you know their fish are gone or if they're out on that uh that canoe trip and they're looking and you know i they you know they could say you know i know i set this down right here where did it go some people say you know that's the that's the uh the little people but i remember uh, a story uh, my late mother-in-law told me once um, uh, and she said uh, you know one time she was sitting at home in Ondekomnikoning on Mindo Missing or Manitoulin Island and she said uh, you know the uh, she was in the kitchen and uh, one of the little people uh, ran through the kitchen and uh, you know and, and in that community that's an understanding that you know you, um, some people will say, you know, seeing the little people is, uh, you know, it's not a good, not a good sign, or and so on. But in other communities, I know people have talked about, you know, even the relationship with uh, the little people as helping us, right, and helping us to uh, uh, to get through different things. And uh, you know, so it, like again, those stories vary from uh, geographic location, and we have to honor the difference in those in those knowledges that are that are held in those ways. Yeah, and and, and, I, and I really like listening to the stories. Now this one's for Ben, and I don't know if he's listening on his headphone or where he is. But, but, and we're going to say this for another program. But, uh, you know, Sabe or Sabe or Sasquatch, without giving it all away. But tell us a little bit about uh, because I know that a little bit. It's a it 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 represents honesty or keeping people honest. I think. But maybe tell us a little bit about that, and we'll save that for another time. But, but because so people are uh, fascinated with Sasquatch, but that's a that's a social media, content, but they they exist in in the teachings uh, and the landscape. Well, I it, interesting that you bring up uh, uh, Sasquatch or Sabe and and so on. I just um, I just wrote a, a little narrative. Uh, uh, piece about an encounter um, around uh, Ekonomage and uh, Sabe, and uh, it's. Uh, I just found out the other day that it's going to be published, so I was uh, pretty excited to uh, receive that news. But when we think about uh, uh, Sabe, often you know we, we were given, you know, uh, from the Creator those uh, those seven sacred teachings. Some people call them seven grandfather teachings, and and so on. And the one that's often connected. With honesty is uh, is Sabe, and uh, or Sasquatch, and you know when we think about that relationship, um, you know when those teachings were given to us, uh, you know they were all a lot of them were all connected with an animal, right? And they were all connected with um, uh, an animal that was uh, uh, that you could you see now when you go out into uh, into the bush and so on, and uh, people would say. Uh, you know, well, why why is it that they that they would attach one to uh, uh, to Sasquatch or just to Sabe? And I said, you know, a lot of our teachings that we that we carry and that we've been uh, given from our from our elders will tell us, you know, at one time Sabe walked with us, and he was in our he was with us, but he's moved away because of the way you know we uh, we uh, treat the treat our Mother Earth, right? We treat the land, so um, you know, maybe one day he'll come back. Uh, and, and be with us, but uh, there's a lots of uh, understanding and teachings around uh, around Sabe. Some people talk about Sabe as a water protector. Some people will say, you know, Sabe is uh, an inter interdimensional, can go to the spaces between spaces and and so on. But uh, you know, again, it's kind of like uh, the Pian Suk or the Mimguesic, the little people. You know, people said, well, you know, they, you know, we. Um, 
uh, they never existed or whatever, and then they find archaeological evidence uh, in Indonesia and they say, oh, well, yeah, maybe they did or maybe they do, right? So that's, you know, just because uh, Sabe, uh, you know, no, nobody has a, a skeleton or something doesn't mean that Sabe is not there. You know, we, uh, there's lots of things like we talk about um, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I was thinking also as an educator and instrumental Indigenous, bringing in Indigenous studies to light and at the university here at Nipissing University and many other places. And, and uh, how, do you, how do you keep track? I mean, do you record these things? I know you're, you write things down and things, and you, and you must consider a book. But how are you going to pass all that on? You pass it on to your family members and students, but you know you're, you are a, a keeper of knowledge. You're a knowledge keeper, and that, that's, that's really important uh, as it, when you pass that on to uh, the next generations or people in general, whether they're native or non-native. Well, I think we all we also have to remember um, there's a couple of things like as as an academic and as an educator and so on. A lot of the stuff that we do is written output, right? Like, and that's kind kind of tends to be in the Western leaning institutions of universities and post secondary education and so on. A lot of the the measure and, and, and focus is on written output and so on, and even in uh, mainstream schools, you know, language is at the top and all this kind of stuff. The way they're structured, but uh, you know, when we think about um, you know indigenous ways and indigenous learning models, a lot of what we um, a lot of what we share is through our, uh, our oral history, right, and our oral traditions and passing them on. And we don't have people don't learn in uh, in a lodge or they don't learn uh, at different times, uh, you know, based upon like categorizations and so on. You you know, it's not uncommon to see more elderly people with with children, and we always say, you know, you take what you need at that time. And uh, you come back to it, right? So it's cyclical. So maybe from what you carry from that, take away from that teaching or that story, uh, it's what you need at that time. But maybe when you come back to it again, you get something else, right? And, uh, you know, it was interesting because I've seen sometimes um, with, with, uh, with students, if we're in, uh, if we're in a lodge or something like that, and, you know, they'll come in and you know, they'll take out their notebook and they want to write stuff down. And I'll say, no, 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 you don't, you don't need that, right? Like that's not... Uh, you, you know, if you want to, you can, but you, you don't need it right now, right? Because that's when we when we learn things. You know, often you know we talk about that uh, uh, experiential learning, right? And you know, when we're learning, uh, and when you teach, you know, uh, you know through the culture, and and you know all of the all of the things that we need are are there, right? And it's just a matter of you know when people are ready ready to hear them. But uh, yeah, often. There's there's a lot of people who have talked about talked about books and, and writing books and um, as, you know, I've had a few people in my you know very close uh, inner circles that, you know talk to me and say you know like you know when's that book coming out Jonathan and I'll say yeah, you know it's it, it's it's there it's it's all, the the idea is there it's kind of kind of simmering on the on the burner at the back but it's it's definitely it's definitely there uh, yeah I know it's I know it's there because you've taught me so much and. And to bring it fast forward to contemporary times in the future, and wasn't that long ago, uh, and, and this is something I want the listeners to, to understand from my perspective, and I don't know what we're talking about at the time, but in, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, you said to me, you know, what are you going to do about it, Bill? Meaning, not just Bill, but what, are, what, are you, what, are you, what is society going to do about this? And, and, and I constantly use that all the time, even in, in, in my work as a, as a trustee, because I, I hearken back and I often say, I was told that, what are we going to do about it? Indigenous people are, uh, that's not in their realm to tell... You know what I'm saying? You said we have to do that. We have to learn, and so maybe uh, maybe it's a good way to. We can't talk about everything tonight, but maybe that's a good way to kind of summarize where we are now as 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 a society. Well, like I said at the start when we started chatting there t today, I said you know everything's interconnected, and uh, we talk about you know the uh, different moons that we're in now and in the winter time, and we often shared those stories and that knowledge at that time but our stories are not uh, and our knowledge is not uh, linear right they're cyclical and you know when we talk about something and we give a teaching we're not just saying you know that's um, 
that's in the past, but it's also prophecy of what could come in the future. All right, like a, a Western, uh, you know, way of understanding that might be, you know, um, it's important to know your history so you don't repeat it, right? And, uh, you know, we think about, uh, you know, the sort of a broad, broad and aggressive policies of assimilation that have been used here in, in Turtle Island and so on. But when we think about reconciliation, you know, there's been lots of, um, you know, work that's come out around reconciliation, uh, you know, going right back to the uh, uh, RCAP of 1996 that came out after OCA and, uh, you know, going back to the, you know, the TRC calls of uh, 2015, which, you know, still have a long way to go if they're going to be uh, recognized or the missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls calls of 2019. So, you know, when we think about reconciliation, it's not so much, you know, what Indigenous people can do because we've given so much in our in our land and our language and our children and so on. Um, but it's also in, uh, you know, if we're going to move forward together, um, you know, because the original, you think about the original two-world wampum, right? You think about those wampum belt treaties that were understood and, you know, even the even a lot of the con, uh, contemporary understandings today go back to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. But prior to that, the original two-row wampum of you know two canoes uh, moving forward, and neither neither canoe interfering with the other as they moved down that river, and you know that was that was the original agreement, right? That was that uh, you know that was the original understanding, and I think you know we we can move uh, forward together, but we also have to understand that. You know, there's um, when we talk about our culture and we talk about we talk about our ways. You know, there there's not one up here and one down there. Like th those those are those two canoes going down that river together. You know, together, but not interfering with each other. Yeah, uh, and I I think that's such an important analogy to 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 understand. And, and I know uh, as we wind down here, uh, you know, I tell my students. It's, uh, and I often do this in outdoor education, do you know an Indigenous person? Uh, I've been blessed because I, I've known two or three, and and, and, and um, if I go out of this life and, and you're my last one, I, I'm going to say to myself, gee, McGwitch for that, because I continue to learn uh, all the time, and I always look forward, uh, and both of us have had some health episodes, and we've come through them, but I always look forward to the next story because... I go away that I've learned something and I can tell people about it. And it's my little way of, of I think, you know, those two canoes going down the river. And, and, and so I do, I do thank you for that. And, and Ben, I think we're uh, that. And I don't know, you have some, uh, some wind up remarks about something and uh, we'll, we'll take it over to you. A big thank you to both Bill and Dr. Jonathan Pitt for that great conversation. And I know we're going to get Jonathan on again to talk about Sasquatch, which we need to do a whole episode on that. We have we have that lined up. It's coming out. I'm incredibly excited for that. Uh, we just need to get the guests together and finally record that episode. But it is one that we will eventually get to and hopefully very soon. Uh, there's other topics. And I, I honestly, I wish I could have been involved in that a lot more. Uh, but with, again, having to run the cameras and audio, there was just no chance for me to really get in and, and, and say anything or really even be able to hear what they were saying until I was able to, to edit it afterwards. If you want to check out more Backroads Bill, you can find us on all of your favorite podcast players and on NorthBayEcho.ca, where you can check out more local podcasts like To North Bay With Love, where yesterday, uh, Lisa actually sat down with a couple of ladies from Near North Crime Stoppers to talk about the work they do. And a very interesting question came up, which is, has crime increased since COVID? Has COVID affected crime here in our, our community. So they kind of answer some of those questions as well as the good work that Crime Stoppers does in our community. And I also did have to confront Lisa at the beginning of that episode about her gum chewing, which number one, she has a terrible taste in gum. But the other thing is she also smacks when she talks. And as an audio engineer, it, it yeah, it just wasn't a good time. So <laughs> you can check that out uh, over on NorthBayEcho.ca or your favorite podcast players. And since this is kind of a uh, podcast about history. We actually have a really interesting uh, episode coming out tomorrow, February 29th, where me and Lisa last week went down to the museum to talk uh, about this new book launch that's happening. That's very, very much about the history of, of North Bay. Of course, we're getting close to the 100th anniversary of, of North Bay as well. The, the Centurion 
uh, year, which is going to be very exciting. That's coming up in 2025. Uh, anyways, that's, it's going to be a really good episode. That's, again, checking it out on northbayecho.ca or on your favorite podcast players. You can also sign up for our newsletter, Echo Essentials, which is a great way to keep a finger on the pulse of everything going on in North Bay. I hope you have a great week, and we will see you next Wednesday for yet another Backroads Build Adventure.